Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Can you guys hear me? You can hear me, yes. Stuart, you can? Okay. Yeah. All good. Okay. Have you, heard, have you heard anything I've said so far? No, nothing. I mean, okay. uh... All right. Sorry, everyone. My uh, <laughs> microphone just uh, malfunctioned. Okay. Well, we'll get started now. My name is Sarah Carr. I am Chief Knowledge Broker for Octo, Open Communications for the Ocean. Uh, and we'll be welcome to today's webinar on barriers, opportunities, and emerging solutions in applying artificial intelligence and machine learning. We really appreciate everyone being here today, and we particularly appreciate uh, Stuart Green of Blue Green Advisors and Fareed Maruf with Tetra Tech um, for being here today. This project they're going to be speaking on was funded by USAID Sufia Technical Services. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. There's two ways you can send in questions and comments. One is through the question panel of the user interface. Um, and I'd, I'd say if you send in questions here, it's a little easier for me to, to read them and moderate them. Um, so that's a good way to send in questions. But we also have the chat, which is enabled for all participants to be able to share. Uh, you can share comments and questions with just the pr uh, presenters or with the entire audience. Um, we just ask that if you're sharing anything with the entire audience, that you keep it on the topic and keep it professional. But uh, we do welcome you to share um, uh, your own knowledge and um, thoughts on, on questions that you see uh, in the chat as well. Uh, and you can, you can share that with the entire audience, but again, keep it professional, please. Um, okay, thank you very much for being here and I'll turn it over to Stuart and Fareed now, thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation for us to join and welcome everyone um, to our session. We've called it Netting the Future, AI's Role in Sustainable Fisheries Across the Indo-Pacific. So again, a big thank you to Sarah for inviting us today. Um, my name's Stuart Green and I work for Blue Green Advisors, a UK-based impact advisory um, firm which works across the blue economy. I'm now gonna quickly pass you over to my esteemed colleague, Pat Farid to introduce himself. Pat Farid, if you could just say hi to everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, good to be here. Thank you, Sarah, for inviting us. Um, I'm Farid Maruf, based in Indonesia. Uh, currently, I'm working with USAID Sufia Technical Services, based in Bangkok. Uh, we work uh, in ASEAN plus three countries in CTI. Uh, prior to USAID Sufia, I was, I were I was working with uh, USAID Oceans and some other USAID projects. Thank you, Pat Stuart. Back to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Pat Farid. So as Pat Farid said, over the last, um, I think, year and a half now, Pat Farid, we've been working together. Um, and today we'd like to um, share some of our 
uh, experience. And in particular, one of our pieces of work that we did that looked at some of the barriers, opportunities and emerging solutions in applying AI and machine learning in promoting fair, legal and sustainable fisheries management across the Indo-Pacific. So if you'll allow me, I'll, I'll pop on forward and then give you a bit of an overview of what we're gonna get into today. So um, basically, um, as I mentioned earlier, Pat Farid and I have been working together and I've had the honor of working with him um, to really dive in and have a look at this regional review of some of these barriers, opportunities and the emerging solutions that we found around IUU. And IUU, which is illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, threatens coastal communities and their livelihoods across both the Indo-Pacific, but also across the broader globe. And it really impacts hundreds of millions of people, and especially we found in the Indo-Pacific. So part of this work, we, um, we had a great time uh, interviewing over 50 experts, um, and we had a look at over 90 different applications of machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, and advanced analytics that are currently being applied to the Indo-Pacific. So um, I guess I would also note that we began our work just about the time when ChatGPT the, was released. So that was kind of late 2022, early 2023. Uh, and we our, our study focused until mid of last year. So we're already pretty outdated, um, as I'm sure everyone knows that the pace of change in this sector and the region and the AI is, is, is somewhat going exponential. So just wanted to, to flag that to everyone. And there's a copy of the publication. Um, we will give you, we're, we'll share at the end a QR code um, and anyone who'd like a copy of the publication, we're more than happy to share that with um, when we get back to the end. Okay, so AI, whoa, lots of things going on, but let's kind of do a quick definition of it. So it's a field of computer science, it enables machines to mimic uh, human intelligence, uh, allowing them to learn, make decisions and solve problems. It's rapidly evolving, as we all know, um, and driving innovation across multiple sectors. So what we did was basically dived into how what's going on in the sector of IUU fishing and human and labor rights across the Indo-Pacific and look at some of the some of the use cases which we'll get into today. But before that, let's let's take a quick look at the Indo-Pacific. Um, we've got some very high ranking IUU uh, countries in the region, not only their domestic fleets, but also the distant water fleets. Um, and that you can see there we've put in the, the country ranking for all the Asia Pacific countries or Indo Pacific countries, and as well as some of the other um, countries around the world. And you'll see a lot of the, those um, countries in the region are, are pretty high on the, on the fishing index. index. Stuart, so important. Um, if you want to, yeah. If you want to cover your camera right now. Ah, yes. Sorry. Thank you, Sarah. On the slide. There we go. Let me pop that off. Is that better? Perfect. Okay. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Donkey. Yeah. I. I'm sure everyone's getting sick of seeing my shiny head. So uh, let's go on. So IU. Here's some of the countries in the region. Um, and then um, you know, regions are very important socioeconomically. Um for the significance of the marine resources. But we found a really good paper, um, 2022 article by Bel Habib and the Billion that uh, analyzed all the documented IUU human rights and smuggling cases across the world. Was, I think there was about 6,000 um, uh, documented cases. Now, of course, there's a lot of IUU that is undocumented, um, but based on their literature review, look at how they flag the Indo-Pacific, yeah, all the black, and the uh, dark red areas, the Indo-Pacific, and then it's the number of reported cases in that region was five to 10 times the rest of the world. So just again, highlighting how important this region is from an IUU and human and labor rights lens. So why AI and why now all of a sudden? <laughs> so let's let's dive a little bit in. So here's, here's a quick, quick look at, uh, compute power over the last 60 years. As my faculty at Singularity University, Peter Diamandis shares that, um, on one of his slides, so um, which I borrowed for this, look at the number of transistors, the size of those transistors, 
yeah, per nanometer, the speed of those transistors, and, and, and finally the cost per transition, per transistor. They've all gone up and down respectively exponentially. So over the last 60 years, we, we actually have chips that are 6,500 times faster and 4.2 million times cheaper. So why AI, why now? We've got a lot of compute power now. Um, and we've seen a, an exponential growth of these transistors in something like 27 billion fold improvement in, in compute power. Um, so that's why one of the reasons why AI and why now. Let's have a look at the accelerating returns. So I'm sure most of you know, have heard of Gordon Moore, who founded Intel. In a paper in 1965, he noted, noted what later became known as Moore's law, that the number of transistors on a microchip was doubling every two years. So let's have a look at what the last century looks like and since silicon was invented and the last 50 years of Moore's law. And we're seeing how many here in the left-hand axis, how many calculations per second for a $1,000 computer can make. So just as a quick anecdote, if we think about the Apollo guidance computer that put humans on the moon, which at its time was really revolutionary um, and developed in the 60s and got that, got the, the vessel to the moon, that was running at 0.043 megahertz computer, which is about 70,000 times slower than your current phones that we have in our pockets. Yeah, so we've got a real shifting in computer power going on. And um, for those of you in the audience who can remember the Betamax or the VHS, the Walkman, video cameras, calculators, typewriters, phones, walkie talkies, cassette tapes. Um, what's basically happened since the Android and the iPhone has come is everything has dematerialized. And we now have in our pockets one piece of technology that fits in a pocket that can do millions of different operations and run really complex applications ranging from high definition video playback, advanced games, and all kinds of productivity tools to name a few. So these, this has been going on in the background and creating a really the enabling environment for why AI and why now. And finally, I think that the biggest kind of um, change that's also going on is we're seeing network coverage and internet access across most of the planet now. Um, and it's even expanding into previous dead zones and offshore areas, thanks to low orbit satellites such as Starlink and others. And so we've now got billions of new users connected um, across the, the globe. And so whether it's, and especially for the IUU and human rights um, aspects, if it's an offshore distant water fleet or a small scale fisher, if they can afford it and access it, we now have connectivity across the planet, which has created this enabling environment for AI now. So um, when you put all these factors together, what this is now driving is what we what is being called the sixth wave um, uh, of innovation. So we've got compute power is going up, the cost of computer going down, the dematerialization of everything into digital devices and connectivity. So hence coming this sixth wave, sixth wave of innovation. So if we go back to the first waves, you know, we've got water power, we had textiles. We had iron, which was invented, and then that led to steam power, rail, steel, through to the third wave, which is electricity, chemicals, and you know the amazing ingenuity that we created the internal combustion engine, which is creating some of the problems we have nowadays with climate change. Um, but all these amazing inventions, they led to petrochemicals, electronics, aviation, and then we moved to internet, digital networks, software. And here we are now in this final, or not final, this sixth wave, which is driven by the internet of things, robots, drones, and AI. And I, and I hope a lot more clean technology. Um, but one thing I'd like to point out in this slide is that this phase is becoming much quicker and much more disruptive. So I hope that helps us kind of frame why AI 
and why now across the, the planet? So going back to Pat Freed and um, our work now that we've looked at kind of AI and how it's on why now, um, what did we do? So we looked at some of the regional use cases. We tried to look at some of the risks and challenges of AI in the region. We looked at some of the barriers, the opportunities, and some of the emerging solutions that we found. So we'll, we'll walk you through a bit more of that now as we dive into the Indo-Pacific. So in terms of regional AI readiness, I'd just like to share here, here's a kind of uh, thanks to UNIDO, which does an AI readiness index. Um, there's here's the kind of the state of play in terms of in terms of the region's AI readiness. As you can see, US is quite far ahead there um, on its overall readiness score with government technology and data and infrastructure. But very close on its heels is Singapore, kind of the hub of the Asia uh, Indo Pacific's um, kind of AI world. I mean, overall score good, government very good. Technology sector, not as advanced as the US, but look at that data and infrastructure set up. Singapore is, is doing really well. Then you've got China, and then we've got all the rest of the Indo-Pacific countries laid out there. So just, just wanted to share that as kind of for the context. Very important as we thought through all the different solutions. So from this list, we then try to identify case studies from and use case studies from each of the countries across the Indo-Pacific, which led us to also have a look at um, business and academic sectors. And we found a very vibrant um, use of AI, AA and machine learning um, across both academia and the business sector, um, which made us hopeful for what we were gonna see um, across the IUU and the fisheries um, state. But as we got into the complexity of all the different case studies that we were looking at, we, we, we found it kind of difficult to work out how could we break down each of the solutions that we're looking at. So of the 90 solutions we looked at, Pat Farid and myself, we kind of scratched our heads for a while and then um, had a series of group description, um, a series of focus group discussions. And then we decided we, we, we needed a kind of a framework. So we developed a use case framework around which we could house each of the different solutions that we looked at. So here's some of the key portions of the use case um, um, framework that we use. So we looked at what is the problem that this solution is trying to solve? What's the data that they were collecting and how did they clean that data? What was the model that they were using, the algorithm, the recipe, um, and how were they training that model? How were they integration, integrating and deploying the model? How are they monitoring their performance? How are they getting user feedback and customization? And then what was some of their collaboration and partnerships? How are they, they scaling out their model? And very importantly, especially around the IUU and human and, and labor rights issues, what were some of the sustainability and the ethics issues that, that, and what was the policy around each of those solutions? So that was how we kind of, um, broke down all these lovely different solutions that we were looking at. So basically, if we run you through the process, so first of all, we'd have a look at what was the problem that the solution was trying to solve and what was the real root cause of that problem? Was it uh, lack of monitoring at sea? Was it illegal fishing? Was it human and labor rights issues? What was it? And then each of the step of the way, we used our use case framework to look at the sustainability and ethics the data collection, model selection, integration deployment, et cetera, until we saw what the solution was um, and that solution at scale. So that kind of allowed us to, to really break down each of the solutions as we moved ahead. Okay, so what are some of the risks and challenges that we saw? So as we go back to the big picture, we saw actually lots of risks and challenges in the AI space, ranging from deep fakes I'm sure most of you saw the uh, the Pope in the puffer jacket, as we show above. Um, and, uh, you know, when you get these deep fakes put together and you combine them with social media algorithms, they can spread like wildfires. And I think um, we're going to see a lot of this, a lot more of this, especially this year with so many elections going on globally to the to the, uh, you know, biased news and information. If anyone's ever seen it before, there's the news network, which is a basically is just an AI run 
uh, website which takes news globally, twists it towards its algorithm, and then throws it out with a, with a spin in a different political direction. So that was another one of the things. So some of the risks, so potential misuse by authoritarian regimes, the deep fakes, which we just covered, um, issues around job losses and mar marginalization of coastal communities who don't have access to these technologies or the capacities to implement them, and a real lack of regulatory framework and alignment of use um, across, the, across the globe. Though I must, we must comment that recently this has got better EU guidelines and I think um, there's been, even yesterday, there was a, uh, the AI, uh, there was a conference in South Korea. And so con um, companies are now voluntarily agreeing to, uh, to stick to certain guidelines around the use of AI. Other barriers that we found as we looked across, so technical constraints, uh, inaccurate, poorly aggregated data, uh, limited expertise and resources, definitely a, a like a brain drain going across across the region, but also globally um, for the those kind of specialized skills and the infrastructure to, to deliver AI. Social and cultural factors, fair bit of stakeholder res resistance, skepticism. Um, and of course, this all gets thrown in with the cultural and the lingu linguistic barriers across the region um, to create a, not a good mix. Um, and then practical considerations, Mobile phone use, Androids versus iPhones. Um, very rare would you find a fisher who's willing to take their uh, their iPhone or their phone to to see um, and things like that. Plus, of course, the a very unclear regulatory and legal framework across the Indo-Pacific, with each country having very different um, frameworks. Opportunities. So, vessel detection and tracking. That seems to be, that was really beginning to work. Uh, predictive modeling to locate high risk areas, gears and boats for IU fishing. So lots of success in that place. Uh, supply chain monitoring to identify sources involved in IU fishing, laborer, human rights, and I would say food quality. Um, so that's the, some of the positive sides. Um, and then opportunities, I mean, really to improve safety at sea. Um, one of the you know, shock, shocking facts that, that comes out of the sea is that every day 300 people die at sea and up to 100,000 people per year. So how can we use these tools um, to kind of improve that? Um, and here's a bit of a framework that uh, we, we presented our use cases and our um, use case framework at the SAPIT Technology Summit in Bali in October in 2023. And we asked everyone, you know, what are the, some of the use cases that they saw, and here's a bit of a heat map around, or a, a, a word cloud around uh, what people were seeing um, and what they suggested moving forward. So um, I'm now going to pass this over to Pat Farid, who's going to walk us through, you know, what were the emerging solutions we saw as part of the work. Uh, Pat Farid, are you okay to join us? Sure. Um, there we go. I'll move us on to the slide. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, some of the emerging solution, I think you can look at based on our study we have uh, on the left side and the right side. This is the framework, you know, for monitoring su surveillance, monitoring surveillance. We have a uh, example, Global Fishing Watch, another op source, uh, open source partnership, advancement in electric monitoring, uh, RECMO policy. Uh, there's increasing uh, on labor and human rights in the region. Um, Wi-Fi on board and all vessel. Although Wi-Fi itself is not constitute uh, AI, it's just communication. I think it was exists in since 2014 effort around to 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 put the Wi-Fi on the boat on the vessel. But with the um, the potential uh, larger availability of Wi-Fi on vessel, this is make make the implementation of AI even faster. Uh, sustainable and ethical solution. Um, and then also uh, growing this course of Chinese distant water fishing. Uh, this is probably so true in the area around South China Sea. Um, next place, please. 
uh, emerging use cases. Uh, we can, uh, we know we help, uh, AI could help us in spotting illegal fishing and human right abuse, uh, smart data for better fisheries plan. Uh, th these are some of the company that we uh, talk to under the, the bracket that, that interest in, in going forward, implement, implementing the AI or some of them already implementing AI. Um, stopping labor abuse at supply chain. Um, this is uh, some company already uh, work on the solution and start have, uh, collecting data um, to have more um, offering on the solution. And always on more electronic monitoring for safety. This is also the same. EM is actually not constituted by AI by itself because I know most of you already know that the implementation EM started before even the AI hype. Uh, in Indonesia, for example, there's a regulation that required a uh, carrier vessel, supply vessel has to have uh, uh, EM uh, through collecting um, time-lapse uh, data or uh, live footage or, or uh, video footage. Uh, some of a small company, some of, some of a, a medium small company using uh, this EM um, for various reasons, including safety. Next. Uh, let's go through, as I went through a discussion, further discussion after the research and, you know, during the research, there are some potential, uh, some interesting emerging solution that probably will show on the screen near you soon. Uh, we know for some time species uh, data collection can be helped by AI through image recognition, like species recognition, wide and size estimation. I think um, some of the companies uh, that are, that actually some of you who I saw from the name already tried piloted uh, to our USAID, pro, uh, USAID Ocean back in 2017. We actually commissioned some software developer to look into uh, the possibility of this. Uh, also, you know that the uh, image recognition can use for counting, quantity counting and estimation, you know, as, this, as the fish moving from the long line or from the conveyor bed, it can recognize and then count by itself. Uh, quality grading is very important. Also, uh, where using the camera, uh, mobile phone, you can do a grading. This is democratized and making fair for small scale uh, to have a common baseline in grading, whether it's A, B, or D, so there's no dispute. Um, uh, fair labor for uh, uh, enforced labor prevention, uh, working hours abuse and safety. There's um, I I coined this idea I think back in 2020. The use of potential use of CCTV. Uh, there's a university in Taiwan actually doing study on this one, looking at the camera. Uh, face recognition calculate the hours of people on the certain location of working location. So then they can know whether this person is working for 18 hours, 12 hours, or, you know, 24 hours. Uh, it also could identify abuse and uh, safety. For example, if somebody get hurt or overboard or something like that. Uh, if e-observer and port inspection, you know, there's observer is one of the uh, big challenges, challenge in the safety, you know, for human. So Eve Observer could probably, uh, using AI could help identify certain uh, incident, as, as well as port inspection, uh, loading and unloading, crew manifest, people who go out, same people who get in, uh, both in uh, the person, also the headcounts. And um, <clears throat> this is requires uh, a, a camera that probably already there, some of this probably already done, but many of this footage would just sit down somewhere in some uh, some somebody um, um, data uh, storage and someone. But AI allow to do uh, analysis. Uh, this is what we call post mortem video analysis. So you can go through the analysis the, through the AI um, and then identify certain like bycatch, illegal activities, and so forth. Um, as more and more data get processed, the system getting smarter and smarter. Um, AI rely on training data, so the important is training data and the algorithm. Uh, vessel identification, uh, for example, identific identifying uh, certain vessel uh, uh, that in, you know, the Chinese distant water intrusion 
to uh, domestic waters or some IUU vessel um, that uh, known um, can be identified through um, the camera and then you can process uh, analyzing analyzing sta satellite imagery imagery and predictive analytics to detect IUU. The other thing that's very important is the better human interface design. Uh, LLM, large language model, now um, chat GPT could actually uh, construct uh, develop to have it as a chat chatbot. Uh, we during SAFET actually we try uh, to have a chatbot kind of uh, application where fishermen can ask either typing or voicing um, on certain information like post harvest, how do I handle this? Or emergency advice, uh, crew, I got sick and where should I do? I get this, where should, where should I report? And the chatbot making it uh, easier for people who are not familiar with structured application, there's a form menu by dialogue and use then the important part is actually you can do it voice or text in your language and get answer in your language <clears throat> the other one is policy formulation and review um you know in the past there's a, a branch of knowledge called regulatory impact analysis where they look at all the regulatory and see whether the impact is there any regulation that contradict to each other what are the regulation that could are uh, not working in certain situation now it, this is can be done through AI. You know, I think at this level, ChatGPT, you can pitch Jeff ChatGPT, for example, two papers, and ask the ChatGPT, what are these two papers that contradict to each other? They can give it to you. Um, and also advanced analysis from large sets of data to reveal trend and more effective uh, management plan and and improve policy making. Uh, some of data scattered. You know, a lot of us. Um, uh, a lot of us engage in organization collecting uh, stock assessment on those kind of thing, data, uh, socio data. Uh, in the past, it's very difficult to connect this data because some of them is unstructured, uh, big data especially. Now with the AI, that they, they can probably done easily. Uh, for example, I'm just good example. If the policy uh, is company implement a policy open and close season, uh, in some country, Muslim country especially, this is might not work if the that open and close back on certain dates. You know, in Muslim, for example, Idul Fitri Ramadan move every year by almost two weeks. So over the time, there's possibility the close season actually when the people need to celebrate uh, Idul Fitri so that they have no income. So this is actually could uh, done easily by um, AI, including adding data like El Nino and other um, uh, climate data. The last one is as assist uh, MCS in more effective operation. Uh, I talk a lot with uh, uh, patrol board. They said, oh, I don't have budget to, to uh, do a patrol. Uh, so rather than they doing canvassing uh, patrol, they can do risk-based patrol by looking data. Uh, they can have analyzed the VMS data and as well as the history of certain data. And if you combine with the report that using vessel identification, they have more better of um, um, uh, doing a patrol. So I think is, uh, this is what we call a uh, risk-based patrol. Next, please. Okay, this is back to you, uh, Pat Stewart. Thank you, Pat Farid. So I'll quickly land us so we can have some time for questions. So I guess in conclusion, what did we find? Um, uh, my, an opportunity for much better use case goals for effective fisheries and management and human rights solutions. So we found lots of great solutions, um, but we found sometimes the solutions didn't quite match with the problem that was trying to be solved at the time. So there's a need for much better strategic alignment going forward. Ethics and infrastructure need a much more robust infrastructure um, and ensuring that AI solutions do meet gender equity and social inclusion and privacy standards. The, the region has very varying standards across um, privacy and gender and social inclusion. And, and as we've seen, there's a lot of bias baked into some of the, some of the models. Um, and we saw a great opportunity for much more collaboration and adaptation across all the different sectors working on AI, especially with, finding an opportunity to engage private sector, government, civil society organization and coastal communities with solutions that 
take real-time feedback and performance metrics for those tools and feeds them back to the communities providing the data and makes them useful for the, the resource users themselves that get benefits from the tools. We pop on. So conclusions, regional fisheries management is uber complex. You've got species, habitat, countries, distant water fleets, different stakeholders, which is fertile beds for AI, AA and ML, which loves complexity. So we, we have really bullish on the opportunity in the region. Um, we, as we, I mentioned earlier, we've seen lots of great use cases across the business and academics um, sectors, um, but government, society, and in particular, the wild capture fishery sector is really lagging behind in some of that. Um, aquaculture, they've got some really good use cases and they've got, they're really investing in different uses of AI, but the wild fisheries capture sector is quite far behind. So we see some good use cases, but a need for much more experimentation and engagement across the sector and learning and sharing amongst countries across the region and globally. So we see an opportunity to accelerate progress. Um, what, one of our big recommendations coming out of the publication is how do we create a safe, collaborative and adaptive ecosystem for AI-driven social grid across the Indo-Pacific and or the globe? Um, and that ecosystem and kind of network should really be anchored on very clear use case scenarios and clarity of purpose and getting quick feedback loops um, across, the, across the use and the users um, of the sector. So that was one of the main findings um, from our work. I mean, globally, huge economic um, and social implications. Um, we really, we both believe we're really at the beginning of this golden age of technological advance, where we hope that AI and machine learning will not only deliver more <laughs> economic implications, but begin to help us really solve some of these complex problems that we have globally. Um, and the Indo-Pacific is a great microcosm for some of those problems. We have multiple economies, cultures, languages, religions. Um, so, you know, how can we optimize the use of AI and machine learning um, in that? Um, but uh, we see lots of uh, opportunities to help support the reduction of IU fishing and human and labor rights. Um, but again, as we said earlier, we really need to, needed to see much clearer use cases and solving real problems and where appropriate um, with the right business model underlying each of the different solutions that offers. So AI could have more profound implications for humanity than electricity or fire. I'll, I'll, we'll end with Sundar's um, Pichai's uh, uh, quote, um, but we hope that we can use that not just for, um, you know, for economic gain, but for social gain across the again across the across the region across globally. So we'll land you there with that's our recommendation. How do we create a network that builds on safe AI, clear partnerships, working under clear policy umbrellas, using clean data, really leverages local and global talent. That where consumers that are inclusive uh, with the right funding, the right leadership, and the right safety systems in place. That's where we really found uh, the, you know, the best um, focus and recommendation from our work. And then just I'll land on, uh, you know, please, there's a QR code here. Both uh, Pat Farid and myself's um, emails are there. You can reach out to Sarah. Um, but you know, if you'd like a copy of the publication, uh, join our community practice please just scan the QR code and drop us an email. Um, and we'd, be, we'd love to share more um, and we'd love to see more use cases, uh, different scenarios from, from the work. So thank you, everyone. I guess we'll, Sarah, back over to you and I'll pop on my shiny head again. And then uh, we'll take, I'll hey. stop sharing. All right, thank you so much, Farid and Stuart. Um, this is fascinating. Uh, I just wanted to remind everyone how to ask questions. You can send them in through the chat uh, or through the Q&A. Um, I wanted to start off with a question. Um, do a, a lot of these solutions that you're describing, do they, can they use existing AI tools such as chat GPT or do you think they require sort of custom tools? Uh, I think, I, uh, there is a possibility for you to create custom tools uh, through using the LLM engine. Some of them actually doing that, but the most important here actually the training data. 
you have to make sure that if they ask questions, you don't get just generic data, for example, post-harvest, for example, maybe fishery people that know better than, you know, people who, you know, common um, mere mortal. So I encourage uh, uh, fishery sector to to enter the this space um, as early as possible. Um, this is a little bit different from the hype from um, blockchain back then, right? I mean, remember two, three years ago, everybody trying to jump to a blockchain, but um, AI actually is massive movement. So one of our study funding also that fishery sector somehow led entrance in technology. I hope it's not happened in the AI. So you can put the knowledge, the data training data and so forth. So the system could not exclude you on the answer. And I just add on, Sarah, that um, at the back end of the publication, we've put we pasted all the different solutions we looked at. There was over ninety there, um, and there's a lot more now <laughs> over the last uh, few few uh, months since we did that. But that that will give you an idea of which which of the different solutions we actually looked at. But yes, as like Farid said, you yeah, there's a lot of opportunity in this space. So we would encourage everyone to look at, build on and build collaboration across some of the tools that are already in place. Yeah, image recognition, sorry, uh, just to close. Image recognition tools, I think Google and others already provide this, AWS. Uh, some companies called K Kawile are actually using that engine. What you need actually training data to put tuna uh, data, other fisheries, other species. Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, so some of the questions that came in, let's see. Can you say more about supply chain monitoring? What type of data are being used and how are the data obtained and analyzed? Can I get, okay, uh, let me take back first step of this and Stuart can enter. So supply chain monitoring, um, uh, basically many of supply chain application like ERP, uh, start entering the AI for their own predictive analysis through, you know, using all the data. But a, a very good example of supply chain monitoring is, for example, the one that I tell you about grading. When the supply chain from fishermen is handed over to middlemen, the middlemen have to report the grade. And then you take a picture of the grade of the, of the meat or the fish, uh, then they can tell that, okay, this is grade A, grade B, and you enter the process continuously. And uh, the the system in the factory recipient also could have additional um, AI capability where they <clears throat> detecting as the receiving uh, and then uh, going through the, uh, the 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 conveyor belt, for example, and those kind of things. So the data could become uh, from external and then from internal companies. And there's a lot of uh, 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 advancement around this uh, supply chain application software or system. And QR codes, blockchain, um, you know, anything that's subjective that humans kind of engage in, I think there is potential for AI to to uh, to not replace, you're gonna always gonna have to have human in the loop, but to help supplement some of that grading that Pat Freud said. I mean, the classic is, um, for those of you who worked in fishing communities is, the, the the middle person turns up and then the fisher lands the fish and they say, okay, that's grade B. And then the fish is like, no, that's grade A. And then you get this argument and there's it's and there's the subjectivity and there's a power relationship that goes on between the middle person, of course, and the fisher. Um, so you know, any any place where there's kind of those types of pain points, we seem to see an opportunity. But supply chain you know, in the next five years, there's no reason why we should not know where our fish was caught, who catches it and where it came from and whether there was human and labor rights issues around that fish. That's, uh, we hope that's where we're heading. Um, and given, you know, the amount of IUU fish coming into both Europe, US, and then that's thinking a north-south kind of uh, mix, but also south-south connection, um, I, you know, I, I don't think there's any excuse um, in the next five to 10 years. And it's it's really up to the sector to create business models around that, that they can uh, that they can support their systems for that. And, and you know, AI initially is going to drive efficiency and reduce costs. But then over the long run, it will begin to kind of replace some of these um, systems. And you really will know where your fish comes from which we, we really hope for in the next few years and could help with a lot of problems. Okay, 
Thank you for Eden Stewart. Um, on some related topics, there's actually several questions in here. Have you or are you considering the ethical implications of using AI in terms of inherent biases that mimic humans, for example, for law enforcement in IUU, or informed consent from potential stakeholders when it comes to interacting with or using AI? For instance, what if someone doesn't want to interact with AI-based tools or technologies? Yeah, I think... So I think yeah, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, I think... The, the a lot of countries, I think the Western countries, especially working on this. But um, my uh, initial take on this one about potential biases, I call it induced biases, um, where bias intentionally made by certain actors to serve their agenda. This bias can be in the form of manipulating data or providing training data that could be not represent the real cases or tweaking the uh, algorithm itself. Um, many, uh, on our study, actually next study is about cloud computing. So AI and cloud computing is something that cannot be separated. I think this is related to a qu qu uh, question that Khalid Mohammed asked later, I will touch on that one. So uh, many of these cloud computing currently uh, especially from the Chinese, uh, Alibaba and so forth, are aggressively offering discount uh, prices compared to AWS and you know um, Google and Facebook and so forth. Now, if we worry about the abuse of human rights, uh, you know, data privacy, thing like that, I think we probably heard a lot that this violation happened in that country because there's no laws protecting uh, you know, uh, data security and data privacy and the use probably also there's no law on the use of AI as this. So I'm what I'm suggesting is that try to use higher standard, Western standard uh, AI uh, facility on the cloud, storage, uh, you know, processing, visual machine compared to the other, other countries. Now, uh, before I hand over to, to it, this is related how actually could a uh, developed country could benefit from AI uh, when there's a poor, poor internet connection. Um, there's actually capability of AI can be put in the device itself. It's called edge computing. So I give you an example. Uh, in Indonesia, we can find this, we call Bebe Pintar, Smart Dark, which is the size of golf ball. You can plug in in USB. You can give instruction, voice, uh, verbal voice instruction to turn off your TV, turn off your uh, air, air con and other electronics. Like Siri, uh, uh, you know, and Alexa and Google. The only difference is that this device is not connected to the internet. So this device smart enough can be packed in the size of small uh, 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 golf ball, no need of internet, can process what AI uh, can do. But of course, the capability limited, right? But as much more um, you know, processing power, like what Stuart said before, there are more and more power coming in. Edge computing also could take more capability without having need, need to connect to the cloud computing. You want to add something, Stuart? Go ahead. Sure, I, I just add that um, great question and a huge gap in the sector around the ethics on good social good AI and there's a real opportunity for, there's a few CSO groups who are beginning to work in this space but huge, someone really needs to explore this a lot more and create as that's what we were encouraging that kind of how do we get a network of using AI for social good practitioners to kind of share experience and put in some of the guardrails that really need to go in now because the 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 rate of change now is really going exponential what we see now what we see in a year's time two years time the, the future is moving a lot faster than we think sadly so um that, that's yeah so huge gap there um no magic solution from our end but i think yeah we need to learn and we need to get into that space and we'd encourage philanthropies bilaterals, multilaterals, you know, CSO groups, 
on the, in each of the countries working to get into that space and create their own agenda and leadership around that because otherwise we will be um it's just going to continue without any guidance or not that was a bit long okay. back to you sarah <laughs> okay thank you and um farid already addressed the question of how can we benefit from ai in the developing countries considering the poor internet connection did you want to add anything about that Stuart? um i think i think it was mostly covered i just you know if we look starlink just has just opened up in indonesia um you know we are in the next two three years the the planet is covered now and so everyone is going to start accessing quickly in a variety of forms so i think we're going to st start to see again that growth moving forward sarah so um yeah um, there was a question and sort of touched on this in, in ways, but um, wouldn't AI provide a means for even greater human rights abuses and ways to evade accountability for IUU? So, I mean, then does it is it going to be an arms race between sort of the bad guys and the good guys using AI? I think it already is an arms race, Sarah, between the right, good and, and the not, bad. But... Yes, and you want to win it, yes. But I'm I'm an eternal optimist. There's always there's always going to be the five percent or the two percent of the kind of the ones for using the bad cases, and the, but the good will catch up, and always catch up, and I and we'll always overwhelm. That's my uh, optimistic kind of lens on it. But we've got to be quick, and we've got to be um, stay on top of it. Um, but yes, we're going to see a lot, and that's why alignment is such an issue within AI. How do we get AI to serve human values? human needs and human good um, and that's a topic that really again needs a lot of discussion and we need awareness coming from everyone around that sector i think there's Thank a you. question um, in the chat yes well it's, it's a comment but I, I would like to turn it into a question um this was i'd like to hear more about practical use cases and a network oh. of practitioners using ai for social good sounds like an excellent idea i'll read the publication and look into the community of practice for tech team thanks all um so are you so can you describe sort of the state right now of networks for um sort of marine practitioners using ai for social good and in particular around this field of preventing IUU fishing and, and human rights abuses. Uh, Stuart, you want to take that? So I guess the the, the only forum that we found uh, regionally was SAFET. So the uh, there was a there's a kind of a network of practitioners. Um, and coming out of that, actually Pak Farid and myself. <laughs> That's where we shared the QR code. We've got a bit, we're developing a bit of a community of practice because we have found no forum to share and talk through some of these issues. So again, this sharing the publication now is part of promoting that. But yes, uh, we think it's a huge need um, across the region. And so we are very, ears wide open if anyone's interested to kind of, to, to, to kind of join and help us and really think through how can we create a much better network um, we have some firms, that we're, some businesses we're working with, some CSOs, um, some government departments. Um, so it's kind of a mishmash at the moment, but uh, we'd love to, um, yeah, to, to kind of engage more. So ping us with any thoughts and ideas. Uh, we'd love to uh, know more. Pat Farid, what could you add? Yeah, I also have a passion about, you know, forming a collaboration between uh, existing company or startup to use AI so they can, you know, some company expert in AI, but some other probably company expert in other like supply chain. So uh, this company could join forces, for example, like um, one of the company that we work, uh, Mass Human, which is especially working on human uh, crew and so forth, uh, would like to introduce them with some other company who work on AI uh, one of the idea, for example, is on the recruitment of crews, there will be AI engine that can scan, if there's an advertisement, can scan all the news that related with that company or that opportunity, whether there's some risk there, you know, human uh, trafficking and so forth, uh, this kind of thing. So um, uh, I think this is something that probably we'd like to see more and more people 
uh, engage and AI, especially on the fisheries. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a question that came in, are you collaborating with Fisheries and Oceans Canada or other Commonwealth uh, regional fisheries management organizations? Uh, my project is not because we actually limited to sort uh, ASEAN plus three countries, but we talked to some um, people from Canada that work in that space, but not specifically the nation that uh, it's mentioned. Stuart, okay. you, what about you? Yeah, we've had kind of small touch points, but yeah, we'd love to know more. And you know, really, yeah, if there's, especially if there's use cases that are already working in fisheries that we can share and vice versa and just kind of get that network going and to really ex we've there is a huge opportunity to really spread out the use cases um, and get some good business models behind some of these um, solutions uh, moving forward so yeah any uh, welcome any feedback from anyone please reach out to either Pat Farid or myself and we'll, we'll, we'll let's see what we can do um, huge opportunity here and we've got to get into this space quick because as we've mentioned things are really changing fast um, so we got we've got to be and we're the good guys I hope so <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and also what what I also found out that you know uh, the fishing Fisheries agency like BFAR, KKP in Indonesia, DFISH in Vietnam. Um, everybody said that oh, we want to implement AI. We want to implement AI. I mean, because actually, uh, one of the opportunities that the AI take the world, you know, by its feet. Every sector is actually jumping into this uh, this thing because you know, it's a revolution. Okay. All right, thank you so much. Um, there's been a lot of comments. I think that'll be useful in the chat that um, I'll send you uh, the chat afterwards so you can see and see who wrote that. But um, thank you so much. Um, this was fascinating, this report. I'm glad we were able to feature it. Um, and I hope um, it'll spur a lot of useful connections. And um, I'd love to see more of these types of reports for other aspects of marine conservation and management uh, as, as AI changes things in the way we work and the way others are working. So thank you so much, Stuart and Ferdy. This is great work. I'm, I'm so glad you undertook it when you did and uh, sort of got the jump on sort of sorting out where work needs to be done. So thank you very much for presenting today. And we uh, would love to um, learn more about the, the networks you're creating and further work. So we hope to have you on in, in the future. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Yes. Okay. Bye, everyone. Sarah, thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. All right. And thank you all for being here today. And we hope to see you on future webinars. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.